Good afternoon. So today we're going to look at um, quality and supply chain management. I realise there's questions about the test at the moment and a variety of content questions as well. Can I come back to that shortly and we'll discuss what the test is about and how it's going to be managed and all the different implications of that. So I guess my first question to you is which is the quality watch on this slide? Yes. Depends. Yeah, I guess. Um, is anybody else? Anybody else got any? Who wants to buy a watch? Maybe I should roll my sleeve up at this point or something. I don't know. <laughs> should be in the market somewhere. What happens if you're in a, a completely darkened room, if you're working in the dark, which I guess we all do to some extent, some would say, maybe the di digital watch will be more functional. Could be, could be in a yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, no, maybe uh, it depends on. Is it luminums? You could be right. If you bought a Rolex with no light inside, you'd be worried, wouldn't you? If you paid that amount of money, it could be in a situation as well. It could be. Um, Save my life, okay, give me your watch. And if you've got a Rolex, you might live. I don't know. You know, there could be all sorts of use situations, I guess. Yeah, so if you extrapolate the ideas of what is quality to something as complex as a Boeing 737 MAX, um, then you can see how, how a customer defines quality can become more and more complex. Although, the ideas, the principles are similar, they're the same. And personally, if I was looking at these things, I'd be thinking functionality, appearance, worth, in terms of value, esteem, aesthetics, um, reliability. If I was a diver, would they operate at umpteenth fathoms? Uh, depending on where do I work, is it, is it uh, practical for my lifestyle? If I wore that watch in my local pub, would I be safe? You know, would I be followed home? Uh, you don't know what's going to happen, do you? There's all sorts of implications. And perhaps you can start to talk about some dimensions of quality, trying to break the problem down into different concepts which you, which you would expect to be in your definition of quality. Of course, quality has been considered a lot over the years. Yep. It's okay. Quality has been a, a major issue. Has anyone got any ideas about why in, in, in manufacturing or, or engineering where quality has been, you know, has been a real headline grabbing thing. Toyota. When I, was, uh, when I was a lot younger, Toyota cars were considered 
the Japanese cars were considered extremely reliable, cost-effective, and captured and swamped the market, became the most competitive vehicle in the country, so much so that you would drive around and people would have buy British on the back of cars, like buy GB, it was that, you know, they were that successful. They worked out how to do, deliver quality and reliable, quality goods, perception of quality, high reliability at a low cost. Their manufacturing system, the lean manufacturing system, was so successful it's been copied around the world in all manufacturing systems and companies uh, everywhere, you know, Rolls-Royce, BA Systems, Ford, everyone is trying to do lean manufacturing because of the success of Toyota in terms of quality. There were lots of gurus to do with quality historically. Just setting the scene here with some context. Indeed, after World War II, there's a chap called Edward Deming, who no one would listen to him in the States, so he went over to Japan and they made him extremely important and, and took him on board and his culture and his ideas. And that's part of the reason why they became the most successful manufacturing nation. And there's been others like Crosby, Duran, leading towards Antaguchi, for instance, is, is another famous guru. And all these gurus' ideas about quality, um, it kind of started off from you can't inspect in quality. You can't get quality by inspection. You have to do other things. You have to do other innovative uh, things. So what used to happen was people would try and inspect everything to make sure there were no defects. But the gurus would say it starts earlier than that. It's systemic. Quality is, uh, is a property of the system. So that's why you had Deming who looked at the management of quality. And also Taguchi who looked at robust design. In other words, how to design for quality. So instead of just inspection, these gurus came up with more innovative management and design for solutions, which led us towards a total quality management revolution where the entire organization was contributing to quality through management and standards. So that's a bit of the background which, you know, just to set the context, to say quality is, um, you know, really a lot of things historically. But essentially you can boil it down to something very simple. It's what the customer wants. Quality is what the customer wants. Who is your customer? What do they want? It's, it's, it's like that. And in Lean or the Toyota manufacturing system, they used to they call this the voice of the customer. Now, the voice of the customer is transmitted through the organization. And the argument is, is if you're doing something which doesn't contribute to what the customer wants, then it's waste. It's, it's, it's a waste of resources, a waste of time. So this emphasis on the customer is critical from a lean manufacturing perspective, which is why Toyota was so successful. They put the customer front and center. If someone was doing something at work, you know, we've all done it, we can be doing something, and it's what we want to do, it's on our schedule. But if the customer wanted us to do something, you do that first. The customer is your ultimate priority, because without the customer, there's no reason for being there. There's no reason for this organization to exist. So ultimately, it's the voice of the customer. And the customer wants all these things. You can break it down into these types of dimensions. It's what the customer wants. Now, from a project management perspective, that transmits to requirements from the customer, which becomes ever so vague and complex. How, do you, how could you talk to someone and explain your requirements for a watch easily? Uh, everyone would try and explain it differently. Everyone would have different requirements. And you would break it down in different ways. You would have different priorities. You would have must-haves, you would have should-haves, maybe you would have could-haves, or, uh, or won't-haves as well. I don't want this, for example. 
So it's the quality is the voice of the customer expressed in requirements. And you can explain quality as conformance to the requirement. Now the APM has called this fitness for purpose as a definition of quality. A f is the fitness of, for purpose or the degree of conformance of the outputs of a process or the process itself to requirements. So it's got in there, it's got in there the requirements and it's got this idea of being fit for purpose, which I think perhaps we've all heard about. We've all heard the phrase fit for purpose and it's, it's come from the project management community and the quality, the quality type community. And they have the degree of conformance to the requirements. And you can imagine when requirements haven't been met. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. So in this, today's lecture, we're going to use the pandemic as our case study. We're going to talk about quality, requirements, loss of quality, supply chains, we all remember the supply chains in the, uh, in the pandemic. We're going to use the pandemic as our, as our thinking tool. So remember the PPE disaster, for example. Remember the rush for suppliers to get PPE because of the demand in the world. Remember the, the sheer ignorance at the beginning of the pandemic when there was no virus. It was like SARS, it's going to be no problem. You know, it's, it's going to be harmless, and then it turned into what we remember. Do you remember the ventilators? The rush for suppliers for the manufacturing of ventilators, because there was not enough. The, uh, the pressure on health workers, and what they required to do their job. The design of systems in supermarkets that we were, um, we were distanced, we were socially distanced within two meters and perhaps we may or may not remember things about a birthday cake and things like that um, which maybe reflects on the reputation of the customer oh hang on What a time for uh, I Manchester to, uh, to, to crash. Currently IT problems at the uh, centre there. So yeah, so today, what are we going to do? Well, we begin to see what is meant by project quality, project quality management. We're going to look at quality management in terms of the life cycle of a project. So quality means something at each stage of the life cycle. And we're going to look at that in terms of the pandemic. And then we look at the impact of quality failures on these different things, which if you might recognize are the iron triangle. Remember the safety cost schedule and these things. So, what is quality? Here's some things which are interesting. Right first time. That's because engineering changes or rework are some of the biggest cost drivers in projects. If you have to rework things or disrupt your project, then you've seen already what the impact is on cost and budget. So you want it right first time. And to be able to do that, you need to spend time up front with your stakeholders in communication. You need to understand each other. Now, in a complex project, that is a challenge and is not necessarily completely successful. So you have to communicate with a variety of stakeholders to enable you to get quality right first time. On time, to budget, which meets these requirements. And we're talking about these requirements in terms of operating, so how the project operates, how an aircraft flies, how we, how we successfully manage the pandemic, 
um, and performance requirements, which is you know the, the actual performance of the project, you know the, the range of the aircraft, its fuel efficiency. Of course, nowadays sustainability is becoming central to the world we live in, and will be the subject of many projects in the future. So what happens is the customer says, "I want this." They say, "Okay." These are my requirements, and these requirements are being collected by the suppliers, by the supply chain, by the people who are going to deliver the project. You know, that team of people could be um, a team of people in Airbus with working with Rolls-Royce as a tier one supplier, working with other suppliers in terms of materials, airframe. You could be working with the people who build the seats, the people who are responsible for sustainability and recycling airframes. So you've got a whole bunch of people which you need to express your requirements to. You can see how potentially difficult that's going to be. That's for an advanced course. And what happens then is you build a specification. Do you remember the project life cycle where we had concept design? So you build a typical specification. This is what it's going to do. This is what this ventilator is going to do. It's going to provide air at a certain rate and do it reliably. Our supermarket system, we're going to design it so it's going to minimize or prevent any infections. You can see, you know, we see where we're going. The PPE is going to protect our staff to have a very, very low or insignificant number or probability of infection. So you have to build some sort of specification which then allows you to communicate with everyone. And from the specification, you build your design. You detail design what you're going to do. So you have a specification for an aircraft, and then you detail design the actual aircraft itself. So okay, so you've got the detailed design, then you pass it over to manufacturing. Well, you do it concurrently. You give it to manufacturing, they've got to make it. So they've got to make according to the design. So then you've got to check what you've made is according to the design. You could have potential defects there. And then when you use the aircraft, it's got to operate as you want it to. And then when you decommission it, you've got to be able to disassemble it as you want it to. So you start off with a customer who says, I want this. You've got to interpret that into a specification. You then use that specification to build a design. You then use the design to build something. You then use that um, hoping it will operate in the way you want it to and then you decommission it. And at each stage you go through that, there's a potential gap in what should happen and what does happen. And these are what's called the quality gaps. Does that make sense? So there's a, there's a slide coming up. Um, Let's go to this. We'll get back to this in a minute. So here, here's the idea of a quality gap. And this is because as engineers, as people, we're subjective. And it's difficult to interpret a customer need into a requirement and then interpret and translate the requirement into a specification and capture all of the requirements. There will be a gap in quality. You will not capture all of the requirements properly. Then if you move from the specification to a detailed design, an embodiment of the specification, you will not fully capture what the specification said it would do. So you've got another gap in quality. And then you go from the design to a manufactured product. So does the product reflect the design? Does it do what the design is telling it to do? So is the manufactured product the same as the design? There's another potential gap in quality. 
and then you use the product and it might behave differently to what you wanted it to do based on the gaps in quality which is an expression of the gaps in quality and then when you try to disassemble and recycle you might find difficulties there where you said you wanted to make this aircraft sustainable but it turned out to be difficult to disassemble which is another gap in quality because it was an original requirement so you get these gaps as you progress through the project life cycle gaps in quality and that's all because it's very difficult to express engineering requirements and express and communicate in a complex supply chain because there's so many stakeholders um, the number of suppliers supplying an aircraft uh, is a tremendous amount so much so that now the strategy for managing the supply chain is to have main suppliers who manage sub suppliers to try and mitigate that complexity and improve management so there's your idea of a quality gap and the idea of things being difficult to interpret at the requirement stage is captured is captured in this in this cartoon so you can see the difficulty in interpretation and understanding especially when you look at things like ships aircraft and especially over the full life cycle of a project then it's difficult to keep things fit for purpose and there are ways of trying to manage quality during the full life cycle to prevent these gaps in quality indeed the the problem in gaps in quality is fully amplified by the traditional software engineering community years ago when software was being built for the NHS or for the Department of Social Security they had this waterfall system where they would capture all the requirements at the beginning you would say I want this really complex difficult software to manage the whole of the Department of Social Security and this is what we want it to do and then they would go away and design analyze the situation they would design software they would program it and they would test it and at the end they would find that the customer didn't want that and it would have to wait to the very end to find that out and it's all down to quality gaps and was because of the initial immaturity of project management and because software engineering was a new thing that that happened but it's the classic waterfall problem with large software projects where the customer says they want something and then a long time later when lots of money has been spent and lots of times expired they find out that's not that's not what they wanted okay my initial Would you like to do the, both exercises? What is quality? I was going to ask what were requirements to beat the pandemic? Have we, we've moved on from quality a little bit now, I guess. We'll do them both. Let's do them both. Your turn. Get my microphone. <laughs> 
Sorry, over, over to you. So I've got a few, a few questions here on the Menti, Mentimeter. What is quality? And I've, I've changed the, um, I've changed the format to some of these, so experimenting a bit with Mentimeter to see the capability. Remember, we're using the pandemic as a case study. But this can be a generic question if you want, but um, the next questions are all related to the pandemic. And I'm, I'm kind of treating the response to the pandemic as a whole project, which is quite significant. Oh. Taught. Yes, of course, yeah. I know the second, I know the second one onwards and the whole thing about COVID. Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, I guess you can, the thing is you can think of lots of things where you're trying to do something unique and promoting change as a project in itself. Even the current government, the Conservative Manifesto is a project. Or well, the delivery, the delivery of the, never talk about politics, isn't it? But uh, yeah, the delivery of, uh, of the Conservative government can be called a, a project. You can think of it as a project, because it has a budget, it has a schedule, um, quality considerations, risks, it has a plan. I guess they've had some sort of unknown unknown right in the middle of their, of their um, project, the Conservatives, called a pandemic um, and, a, and a, a conflict in, uh, in Europe. So that wasn't part of the plan. So you've got lots of contingency planning going on. But look at the disruption and impact it's had on their world. And it's the same with major projects. It happens on major projects. Things happen and it disrupts your entire project world. You know, you have to manage these things. That's what project management is about. We're going to risk next week. There is, there is sometimes they call the um, gold plating in projects where people try to increase quality needlessly. They gold plate something when it's not necessary. You, yeah, so you, you try to, you're operating at a level of quality which isn't, it, which isn't required. You just need to do what the customer wants. You know, the customer just wants to do something at a certain cost and lead time. The digital watch is fine if you just want to know the time. Are you not, fra not afraid of losing it? You know, the Rolex has its own, has its own thing. So my next. Yes, correct. People, people do that a lot. You know, they try to, they try to please a customer by giving them something which isn't necessarily required and spend more money than they should and defeat the quality objective by spending too much money. And also the customer says, I don't want this, so why have I got this? So, so it's... Yes. Yes, of course. So, and that goes back to the iron triangle. Remember the iron triangle of trade-offs between quality, cost and performance. You know, in the pandemic, um, look, look at the Brazilian response to the pandemic. Their economy was such that they couldn't, they couldn't be as careful with their population as the UK because lots of people were living on the breadline. If they didn't work, it would be worse for their health than if they had, you know, real... Uh, a, a comparable response to the, I guess, the wealthier countries. So, you know, you've got a basic trade-off there between cost and quality. And your stakeholders in the project, the population, uh, the economy of the country, it's almost, you know, the, the fundamental decisions do reflect project management. And the vaccine was somehow 
a technology which had, was almost pre-prepared, pre-fabricated technology for vaccines. If there had been no Oxford University vaccine, things would have been a lot different. But look at the requirements for the Oxford vaccine. It has to be accessible by poor countries. It has to be cost effective. So their technology, their requirement was for the government to only sell at cost in high volumes to countries which didn't have that technology. So that was a major part of their requirement which was reflected in their research and development part of the organisation which fed into the project. So the requirement to have a cost-effective cost vaccine for the world is from Oxford University. What about the lack of ventilators and equipment? The lack of PPE? We were supposed to have a store of PPE, weren't we? And it, was, it wasn't fit for purpose and it had been poorly managed before the pandemic began. Does anyone remember the Dyson ventilators? So Dyson's manufacturing company run a project on, on ventilators, um, was able to use their manufacturing capability their existing capability to answer the response. But the supply chain management also ignored other manufacturing companies. Remember in the news, there's lots of companies who were able to build ventilators who were ignored in the melee, in the poor supply chain management because of lack of capacity, lack of skills, lack of time to enable the right suppliers to be chosen. So they were able to build a ventilator fit for purpose. Okay, back to where we were. So in terms of, we know what quality is. Um, we know what quality gaps are. Um, in, the in the design phase, then, it, well, in the, requ the requirements phase, you're able to make these trade-offs in the Iron Triangle. Do you remember the Iron Triangle of cost, quality, and lead time? So, if you, know, if you want to improve quality, you're going to have to spend more money. And maybe it will take longer for the project to deliver. So, this is an important trade-off space when considering the requirements. Maybe you want something to market as soon as possible. What happens is, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's one of the Dyson things, you know, they have to be to market as quick as possible with a fit for purpose ventilator. And I guess in that trade-off space, then it's cost which will have to give, you have to spend more money. Which then you have to go to the government and they will, if they will pay the money as a customer and that's an example of the trade-off which will happen. And here you can see that safety must not be compromised. Safety is a showstopper. If you have a safety event in industry, it can mean the death of the company. I can think of a few companies like the, um, the train crash at uh, Potter's Bar destroyed the contractor. They just disappeared after that. I think they came back to life years later. But they, you know, no one would do business with them. They had a terrible reputation after that. It was a showstopper, safety. Another thing is, at the design phase, you hear of DFX, design for. So typically, you can imagine a designer in an office with, with a CAD terminal, um, with communication links, review meetings, trying to design a ventilator or design a supermarket system requires the right information to enable the correct decisions for quality. 
No, you need design for cost systems. You need design for performance systems. You need some sort of decision support to help you. Design for assembly. Design for obsolescence. Design for maintenance. Design for reliability. You can see how difficult and complex a job design actually is in meeting requirements. And one of the problems is obsolescence. You know, when, when BA Systems starts to build responses to government requirements, they start to build a design, and before they finished the design at the bid stage, a large percentage of their design has gone obsolete because it's electronics and software. The manufacturer supplier no longer supplies that electronics. You can see with Microsoft operating systems or software versions, they, they turn over quite fast. So suppliers stop making certain things and they go obsolete. And that's a real problem when you're thinking about quality. Because how it's no longer fit for purpose, because if something breaks, you can't replace it anymore. You have to have some sort of obsolescence management system. So there's, I've got a few obsolescence resolution profiles in a slide, subsequent slide, which will um, shed some light on that. Um, should go there now. Hang on. So in, in terms of obsolescence management, you can, try a, you can try a few things. If it's electronics, some would say that the best thing to do is store it in nitrogen. You've got loads of circuit boards as replacement parts for when something breaks. Then you employ a company, there are specialist suppliers out there, who will just put everything into nitrogen liquid and it preserves the the quality, the reliability of the component, so that um, that's the best way you can manage the obsolescence. The most expensive thing you can do is wait for it to break, find out there's no one there to replace your part, and then have to redesign, re-engineer uh, a whole new replacement part while the project just waits doing nothing, earning no money, creating no benefits, well, this obsolete part is redesigned into a non-obsolete part and some sort of replacement made during the life of the project. So the impact of obsolescence is absolutely dramatic if you want your project to be available and performing and earning benefits for you. So if your ventilator, your ventilator's broke and there was no replacement part, the best thing to do would be to throw the ventilator away. Um, perhaps. There's all sorts of different things. You can cannibalize previous designs. There's something called form, fit and function replacement. So you can find something which is similar and does the same function in effect, but it's from a different manufacturer. So it has the same geometry, the same form, has the same function, and it can be assembled in the same way, and it's a form, fit, and function replacement. So uh, there's lots of obsolescence resolution approaches you could use. So form, fit, and function replacement basically means use non-identical parts. Um, so uh, a capacitor, for example, if a capacitor breaks in a propulsion system then if you can find a capacitor which has the same geometry, the same capacitance, and can fit into the propulsion system in the same way, and that's a form, fit and function replacement from another, another supplier. Which parts of the same geometry, the same parameters, and the same 
technique. Yes, the same, yeah, so it can be assembled in a similar way. So this is quite advanced actually, so I think we could be going a little bit off, off, um, off course with this. But obsolescence management is really a really interesting subject, uh, which we can come back to. So again in our des design phase, remember our, our quality gaps. Remember we've gone from our requirements, our voice of the customer to requirements to design, and we've got to meet the requirements. And, you know, sometimes we can over-engineer solutions. You know, we're trying to interpret requirements and optimize the design response, and it's simply not easy. And what can happen is you can get these particular problems. So you could get a poor product specification. After your requirements phase, you produce the specification. So you could get that poor product specification, which then passes on that quality gap to the design. And you end up having to catch up, try and close the gap in quality by uh, trying to work concurrently on the quality issue while you're doing the rest of the work. So you get this concurrent engineering effect in manufacturing where you're trying to solve a problem while doing something else. So you want to do each phase as effectively as, as possible. So to be able to do this, you need to spend the time and interpret and understand the requirements through communication. You've got to communicate with your customer and your design team and your suppliers. You've got to have the best design reviews and channels of communication and the best people possible. So that's why you've got these subject matter experts and teams which are central to successful design, um, quality design. So if you can capture the requirements into specifications as effectively as possible, you can also create some sort of acceptance criteria. You know, this, this specification says the project is acceptable when, you know, when, when we're within a certain tolerance, you know, when our geometries are within plus or minus so many nanometers or so many millimeters or so many meters in cases maybe with uh, shipbuilding, for instance. So there's different, different levels of acceptance criteria. So you can have tolerances on your specifications and you say, you know, it's acceptable, the quality is acceptable if the specification is within these parameters, is, is, within, this, is within this range, I guess. You know, it's, so the specification can include ranges of acceptable criteria, of acceptance, sorry, which is based on a criteria. Sometimes you know, in projects, you're, you're, you're really dependent on technology. In fact, companies are betting that technology will mature on time. Um, if, a, if, a, if a technology is slow to mature, then you can't include it in your project. So you have to manage that. So your technology management has to be really, really on the ball. So that best practice in this area, people will say you must consistently manage your technology maturity throughout the full project life cycle. You can't just forget it at design. You've got to keep revisiting to make sure that you're progressing through these technology readiness levels so that you get to the level where you want TRL9, which is an actual technology system qualified through successful mission operations. So you've got to be very clear on the TRL levels and the effort required to go from one to the other. So that's an example where we have to manage things effectively. So how do we better manage, how do we better manage design, quality in the design? So we need these multidisciplinary reviews. You know, we want everyone together to communicate. A bit like in the, you know, you see these complex NASA projects, 
you've got the mission control team, you've got all the, the teams, the, the supporting teams, they're all working together. The best brains in the world at NASA are the best brains they can muster in the country. And you can work for NASA if you're not from the US. So having multidisciplinary experts to, to look at what's important, criticality, and where the technical risk is. And then you need to go to your suppliers and have a look at their processes and have a look at what they're doing and does it conform to standards or your expectations to what they should be doing. Is your supplier competent? If you audit your supplier, have they got the right machinery? Have they got the right people? Um, automotive are good for this. Automotive are really good at supplier management and audits. You know, they will be in your company every day, developing you as a supplier, developing your methods, your technologies to be best in class. So automotive is, is really good at that. And then you've got to make sure you've given enough definition of requirements and specifications to the supplier. You know, they must have the correct information. And this is where there's another opportunity for a quality gap. You know, if you provide insufficient information to them, and have, have they questioned that specification? Has there been a communication? Have, have their experts understood things? Do they have something to give to this specification? To, can they validate it and, and contribute to that process? So you want your suppliers to be capable and competent and have the right number of people. Um, so the, the capability can all, come in all sorts of forms. I know um, BA Systems have got um, a factory floor which is the most stable in the world. It's the most stable floor for manufacturing aircraft. And you need that stable floor to be able to do assembly um, to real high levels of repeatability and accuracy. And it's so good that Boeing um, actually pay BA Systems to use our invention in their factory, and one of their, one of their competitors, to be able, for them to be able to be capable to work on aircraft in the US. So that sort of capability um, is an example of the capability that your suppliers may or may not offer. So over, over to our next, our next question. What's happening? So back to our, back to our pandemic. Do you remember what the problems in our, in our project pandemic were when we were designing our response to the pandemic? Yes, the conspiracy of optimism. Everyone wanted to succeed um, and they had to promote a positive message as well to the, to the population. Just imagine if you told the population, we're all going to die, there's nothing we can do. We've got a chance though. Uh, I, I guess that's, you know, that's, not, that's not obviously a fully accurate statement, but you, know, you, have, to, you have to get things to work and prevent wholesale panic, even hysteria. <laughs> yep. Excuse my French, but twice. Some people, some people weren't convinced with the whole bunch of rules. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lack of, a lack of uh, pen penetration of the education. Yeah, there's um, maybe the communication, the communication to, to stakeholders, users of the project, the general public, I guess they're the users, could they be? Stakeholder users of the, of the project. I think, isn't it, sometimes the general population polices itself. Well, that's the idea, isn't it? The uh, policing is only important in the UK because of the cooperation of the general public. 
I guess in, 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 they say in America, isn't it? They say in the UK, stop or I'll shout stop again. <laughs> Whereas in America they say, stop or I'll shoot. Uh, What about obsolescence? Was it, what about the obsolete PPE? Do you remember that? Ah, I see, this is my new capability Mentimeter now. It scrolls. <laughs> so you're the, fir you're the first engagement of the... Uh, what's it doing though? What's going on? It's only scrolling on one side. Is there something... Oh, there we go. Yeah, so designing the, um, did they over-engineer the design, do you think? Because there were people who said we, we shouldn't have had lockdowns, didn't they? Did we over-engineer at the design phase? We spent a lot of money. Did we spend too much money? Did we have too much budget? Should we have had a, a, less, a less expensive budget? Well, there was the, the opposition, wasn't it? The effect of the opposition. I guess they're part of the design process as well. They're like a stakeholder in the design process and they're, they're kind of impacting. Well, we didn't know that at the time, did we? But uh, during the design phase, they were ignoring their own... Dominic, yeah. It's like, that's, like, that's like poor practice. It's like uh, they're not following the best practice in design. They didn't, they didn't think. They, did they have a contingency for that? Did they have time to review things and think, hang on a minute, we could have be in real trouble here. We're not even following our own philosophy, our own design. You know, they probably didn't have time. They were constrained in the Iron Triangle. No time, loads of budget, trying to get the biggest quality. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You have to embarrass them. Show them evidence. Show them facts. Show them. Show them. Show them real facts and evidence, and then how they react. They'll maybe make them look as silly as possible. I think is the uh, is the only solution. Like saying, there's still a flat Earth society, isn't there? There are people who still believe that the Earth is flat. So, so what do you do? I mean, in terms of, in terms of um, trying to get people to change, one of the psychological theories is to show them, uh, it's called unconscious incompetence. They're not aware, or maybe they're liars, but they're not aware that they're incompetent in terms of believing in that. And then you're supposed to move them to a stage of conscious incompetence. They go, ah, the earth is round. I can see now from being in the International Space Station, although it does look flat. Um, but you know, so, and then they can move on to change. So you have to move them through a psychological, these steps in a, in a psychological process. So maybe this sort of education and this sort of operating can easily, easy have been a good way to convince people that they're at the wrong. If you, if you ever have another pandemic, yes. it's easy to try and do this sort of social engineering. Try and embarrass them. You know, it's, it's a complex subject, but yeah, it, information, um, Transmission, propaganda. It's difficult, difficult to, you know, uh, I don't profess to have the answers to that. What about, what about availability of information? Designers need information, don't they, to operate. They need to be able to communicate with people. They need to be able to have the information to make decisions. They need the awareness of the capability and capacity. Do you not remember as well the supply chain, how it broke? The whole supply chain was just in time, which is a Toyota production system thing. You know, trying to avoid waste. Waste being lots of inventory. 
stop storing loads of things, only, only make something when you're going to sell it, is a Toyota thing, it's a just-in-time philosophy. You know, and this whole philosophy was driving the world because of the success of Toyota in building quality, reliable, cost-effective vehicles. And so, the whole world copied Toyota to become more competitive, and then the whole world broke when the pandemic came along, and just-in-time was not enough, we needed inventory again. And we had this just-in-time plus as a new solution, which supply chain people tried to, tried to engage us with. Are you okay with that? I think this is a better system, isn't it? It's better than the word cloud. It's, uh, I'm going to have to press uh, escape a little bit here. That's moving forward. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an implication for the supply chain. Government engaging the supply chain spent too much money. That was not fit for purpose. PPE not fit for purpose. Lack of supply chain audit. Lack of capability, lack of capacity. Would that happen at Nissan or Toyota in their, in their supply chain, which is stable, which has got you know, a long-term relationship between customer and supplier? The, the, the chances of that happening will be extremely minimal. But because everything is new, and it's a new technology, technology maturity, um, the supply chain is broke, there's high demand, there's high uncertainty, the suppliers are not being audited properly, suppliers are not being quality checked or managed, um, the priority is availability, then we get mistakes. And then the stakeholders, the, the general public, um, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good to your customers, your general public. You lose goodwill, you, lo you lose reputation in our project pandemic. We start to lose lots of reputation and these things. So we're moving on to supply chains next. Give you a five minute break, comfort break. Back online at five past, Let's see where's he? No, seven minutes past four. Got some more project pandemic questions to ask you about the supply chain next. That's where the, that's where the real fun started, wasn't it? The, uh...
Hello, back on. Back here we go. So our, ne our next stage in our quality gap journey across the full life cycle is our suppliers. Remember the suppliers in, in the pandemic? Who could forget them? <laughs> well, should we want to forget them? So you've got to be able to work with suppliers. And I think the problem in the pandemic was we didn't have time to work with suppliers. And hang on a minute, you've got this, you've got this thing called entryism where suppliers are trying to enter into a market, a lucrative market, with minimal capability, but with a promise of lots of profit. And if they get it wrong, so what? There's not a pandemic next year, so they'll just move on. So you've got a unique situation there. So you've got this entryism where companies are just trying to get into the market, and do you believe what they say in the face of lucrative deals? And you might have political, maybe a, a smidgen of political corruption do we see evidence of that? With the, uh, you know, jobs for the boys, isn't it, they say, they say in Parliament or something, where, you know, they knew a supplier and it was a unique situation. They could get lots of business and profit. So there's a, maybe a degree of bias going on in supplier selection, which wasn't really very, um, not much of a scientific basis in terms of supplier selection. No sound judgment was made, more of a, a race of desperation to, uh, to get to market as soon as possible. So there's a point there, you can't really transfer risks to the supply chain because you'll destroy your supply chain, essentially, and you'll be left with a risk. So if you say, this is too risky for us as the customer, you own that as a supplier, and it sends them out of business, you're back with the same problem. So you can't really transfer your risks. So obviously we all, well, it's not obvious really, um, uh, in National Grid where I used to work, the capacity of National Grid has greatly diminished towards a supply chain. And there are strategic gas distribution partners who do most of the work as contractors. And there is now a minimal internal labour force and capability to do capex, capital expenditure replacement in National Grid. In BAE Systems, they are a systems integrator. They call their core competence, you know, that their ability to integrate systems as their crown jewels. You know, that's their, that's their central value, their worth as a company. They can integrate systems. The same with automotive, they can assemble vehicles, but they don't manufacture the components or the subsystems or even the engines. So, you know, whatever your core competence is, your, your so-called crown jewels from the BA systems perspective, then you need a supply chain for the capability and capacity in today's high technology global markets. Um, for example, you know, I went for a job interview with Dyson several years ago, and they said two things to me. We're building, a, we're, we're building a factory in Singapore, and we need people to be in the factory and manage the factory and these things. And then I think a year later, they closed the factory because it wasn't a good idea. That was one thing. So they were trying to build factories in a global community, and they were looking for skills in Singapore as well and low-cost manufacturing capability. But I guess that was their own capacity, their own capability. They also told me that uh, it's difficult to work here because Dyson keeps telling us to do things which isn't logical. He comes in and just, he's an entrepreneur, so he just tells us what to do and it's frustrating. It's a little aside there <laughs> for things. But, but, but fundamentally, um, organizations have downsized to take, to take advantage of the global globalization uh, of the economy. So there are now markets all over the world. There's capability and capacity all over the world. So, you know, you might find lots of people who, you know, programming or software engineers in a particular part of the world where you might engage with a supply chain. Certainly the low-wage economies, people try to build factories or engage suppliers where the wages are low. Um, yeah, so it's about, it's about having to engage capability outside of your own core competence. And you do that to different levels of collaboration. You either 
you know, you could buy nuts and bolts if you're Rolls Royce, and it doesn't matter. You can engage lots of different suppliers. But if you are trying to build a, an important part of the engine, then you need to have a closer relationship with that supplier, and that supplier needs to be part of your entire process from requirements capture, design, manufacture. You have to have a close relationship with some suppliers than not. The best in the game for suppliers, I guess, sometimes you could say, is the automotive industry, like the Volkswagen Supplier Village, where all their suppliers are on their doorstep and they're in constant communication. They have supplier improvement teams, just like Nissan do, and they make sure that your manufacturing processes have a certain capability and a certain repeatability, so they they almost ensure, assure quality, they do quality assurance through supplier development and engagement. So what they're basically doing is saying, this is how you do lean manufacturing, Mr. Supplier, Mrs. Supplier, this is how you do it, and we're going to help you get there, be best in class, however, we're going to ask for a 5% cost reduction year on year. Um, as a price of, of being our main supplier, or being one of our main suppliers. However, you've got the security of a regular customer. So that's the kind of supplier relationships you have in the automotive industry. So you'd have a supplier in project management to, you know, to, to get capacity. Uh, that's why you would want that. Indeed, in terms of How you would manage suppliers, you would collaborate with them, you would know them by, you know, you'd be on the phone to them every day, you'd know them as a friend, you know, as a friend and colleague. You have to provide this leadership in terms of supplier development, like you would in Nissan and Toyota. It's because, because the relationship is so good that suppliers don't want to default on anything and sometimes end up flying late parts by helicopter to, so they don't, they don't default on their contract of regular delivery. It's not unknown to have you know, the odd helicopter flying across the northeast to develop parts to Nissan. Suppliers will refuse to default on what exactly? So if you've got such a good customer like Toyota or Nissan and you're late, they'll go somewhere else. So they have helicopters instead of lorries to get things there on time when they're late. Okay, so suppliers will refuse to default on anything relating to good customers. Correct. So this is why some companies possess helicopter contracts to transport freight fast. Yes, um, and indeed, you know, they have Hercules aircraft if you're in the power generation business. Have a Hercules aircraft waiting with the propellers going for the late power generation subsystem to fly it across the world. Otherwise, they'll default and it'll be, they'll, lose, they'll lose a customer and goodwill and reputation. And people will perhaps lose their jobs. So that's why things happen like that. So that's part of this. You know, you want, you want equipment that is right first time, delivered on time by helicopter if required. You want them to be a good supplier to work around you because you're in a complex environment. You know, so you want them to be, to be flexible, which is difficult in work, you know, in, in the commercial world. It's a, you know, it's a real difficulty to try and work around someone if you've got your own schedules. However, you, know, you can make long-term plans. So what problems can occur in the supply chain? Well, political. This is our project pandemic, I guess. If anyone's ever applied for security clearance, I think during the pandemic it was down to 12 months lead time to get security clearance for, for if you're going to work in the defence industry. And that's when you ask, they ask everything about you, you know, everything. You know, to know, uh, so that's, you know that, can be, that can be an issue, you know, that's why the defence industry has, they have a lead time on staff, they can't just employ someone. They have to employ someone, wait the time for security clearance, and they can go somewhere else in the meantime. So, you know, you've got these issues. If your supplier is fragile, doesn't have cash, we talked about cash flow problems. 
What happens if your supplier runs out of cash? It's a fragile supplier. And they might have, you know, obsolete equipment. We've talked about obsolescence already. So they might have obsolete production lines. If they break, that's it. They can't get it going again. They have to go and uh, re-engineer or find a form fit and function replacement for their production line to get it to produce things again. So coming back to the types of suppliers, you could have one supplier like in automotive, but, but you want to promote competition. So you want really several suppliers with similar capability to drive the price down and promote quality improvements because they're trying to get the same business from you. The worst position you want to be in is where you're monopolized. There's only one supplier. And you can get into that position if you, if, you, if you don't manage your supply chain effectively. You can get monopolized by someone and they will charge you higher prices and perhaps you know, have, have, have low uh, quality. So sometimes you know, suppliers can cease to exist, like Carillion, for example. And these things can happen as well. You know, the supplier tries to save money by getting you to buy into their standard product. If you select the lowest price bidder, you end up paying anyway because you have to pay for their mistakes. Coming back to my example in National Grid, there's, there's a, um, a company called PPC, I think. I can't remember now. Um, PMC. They're a really high quality supplier for repairing high pressure pipelines and they're expensive and so National Grid sometimes gives lots of business to lower price companies from outside of the gas distribution sector which are of lower quality and they know that, they know they're going to have problems, lack of safety staff, lead time problems, you know they're going to have problems managing them in the main but they're trying to drive the price down from their high quality suppliers. And often you, you can get your contractor complaining about the subcontractors not doing their job. We've had problems with Apple, haven't we? Not having visibility of their tier three suppliers in terms of social responsibility. You know, there's, there's people being exploited in, in sub-sub suppliers, sub-subcontractors, which aren't visible from the main customer supplier management team. And that causes tremendous problems in terms of goodwill and reputation, for instance. But anyway, if you get poor quality, it will lead to rework, which comes around to my next question. Um, still going with that? Aren't we? This one. So having said all that about supply chains, what happened in the pandemic? I think this is my revolving door one again, so it's, this might be the preferred mentee from now on, until I find something different. I've got rid of the, um, what's the, uh, the other one? Padlet, that didn't work last week. I'm not, I'm gonna have to try, that could take me about a month to try and work that out. Why did Padlet not work? Even though the UK is, you know, is, is one of the biggest economies in the world, it doesn't necessarily have the right capacity because its manufacturing base has deteriorated over the years. You know, because the global globalization, the global economy, the low wage opportunities to, to put manufacturing where it costs less and is therefore more competitive in a cost sense, then there's less manufacturing available in the UK. And so there's less manufacturing capability or capacity, both capacity and capability, then it becomes difficult in times of crisis to suddenly mobilize a manufacturing base which doesn't exist. So that's a real problem, you know, trying to, trying to, I guess, re-engineer or re rejig manufacturing machines for a unique design they were never meant to make. So
So lack of, lack of capacity and capability, um, lack of engagement, you know, it's very difficult to form close relationships with so many potential suppliers. Remember, some were ignored. You're on the news saying, we've got the capability, and this person who this government minister knows has got the contract, and has spent loads of money on them, and we've, we're here trying to survive as a business, and we're important to the local economy, and we've been completely ignored. So, you know, there's, there's those risks which are happening. Dyson, you know, if we didn't have Dyson, who would have made extra ventilators? But at least we had the capability. We had, there's a Dyson University, isn't there? I think Dyson have got their own university to promote skills in the UK, so they can, you know, engage with them and try and employ them in the future. So they've got their own campus, or part of a campus somewhere. And it's like Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce have got centres here in Manchester and all around the UK trying to develop you know, new talent for the future, because that's where, that's where their value is going to come from. Do you remember all the supermarket people were put at risk as well, weren't they? Certain, certain workers who were not paid a great deal were put at severe risk, like uh, transport workers, um, assembly, you know, people who had to go to work to survive, were all put at risk. Uh, all the supermarket workers having to work to provide food to the general public. You know, our, our kind of um, suppliers which were stable to the economy, you know, we're all, uh, we're all affected in terms of safety. The, now you can see the impact on the NHS. There's a strike now because of you know, the lack of appreciation or, or remuneration for, um, for the staff who were involved. I guess the main, the main supplier to Project Pandemic is the NHS. And certainly the, the, the birthday cake episode in terms of managing suppliers. I don't know. <laughs> no one saw it. No one was there. <laughs> you know the birthday cake? Boris Johnson? Project Pandemic. Yeah, it's part of the entire project. Yeah, the kind of supplier management. The supplier management team were um, promoting unethical behaviour, ruining their reputation. Yeah, limited mobility. You've got some good points here. I'm sure I'll be able to, to record. I've got these recorded, so I should be able to share these on, on, on the Blackboard system. The other ones we've done as well in previous lectures pretty soon. Good. Now then. So we can improve supplier performance in the pandemic, hold them accountable, evaluate them. Well, they weren't evaluated, were they, properly? I think the, um, the, the civil service was really inundated, didn't have the capacity for proper evaluation. And there wasn't time to spend in terms of making sure there are quality processes and having early involvement. There just wasn't the time. There wasn't the time to manage the supplier's performance, to engage just like there is in, in Nissan and Toyota, or make corrective actions, or maybe innovate and look to do things differently in the future, like lessons learnt. You could try and replace them, or do their work for them in times of crisis, which sometimes is critical, especially, especially in defence. And we did have this multiple supplier strategy. We couldn't go down single source. That was, that was, that was uh, unreasonable for the project pandemic. And single source, you know, is, is an automotive thing and has its, uh, has its connotations, but you do get monopolized. You know, you do get, you lack bargaining power eventually with one supplier. They gain more and more power. So you want the competitive route as we said before. Now contracts are an important part of quality and when you sign a contract, maybe we'll come back to the, 
the contracts in the pandemic, they were also in the news. You work out who owns the risk. So there are different types of contracts. And, and coming back to the point about taking your time about things, you know, the, the, the more time you take in terms of requirements capture and communication and supply chain management, then the better place you are to manage your risk in your project. If you rush things, like in the pandemic, then you get risks happening because you haven't got the time to, to do your procurement properly. And that's where the government was in a real lot of trouble. You know, they kept saying, look, this is a pandemic. We haven't got the time. We've tried our best. We've had to spend lots of money all of a sudden. You know, we don't want people dying. You know, all these different things. There just wasn't time to, to do the supply chain management. And then later on, people will, will, will draw out problems. In projects, you work out who is best placed to own the risk. And into, or who is best placed to manage the risk. So you've got some options here. You've got the firm price. So you've got the contractor is taking the risk, but there is more certainty in how much it will cost. Or you've got the, the fixed price, where the customer takes the risk, um, and there is less certainty in how much it will cost. So it's really about who will who will engage, who will manage the risk, who's in the best place to manage the risk. But it's a, it, it's a, it's a fixed price. So once you've decided on the price, that's it. You know, you've got to take, take the pain, whichever side of the fence you're on. So is it the contractor or is it the customer? That's, what, that's the kind of negotiation you've got to have. Or you can enter into a more complex arrangement which are these performance partnering arrangements or target cost incentive fee. So in other words, you have some sort of pain gain. If I give you an example from the mains replacement in National Grid, they come up with a cost, they come together, they agree on the, what, what work is going to be done, they agree on the budget, they agree on the basis of estimate, they make some assumptions, they come to some sort of agreement, some sort of target cost over how much it should cost. So they come up with a target cost and then it could go over or it could go under. So there's a pain gain. If it goes over, then the supplier gets hit. If it goes under, the, the, the supplier makes more profit. So it's called pain gain because it depends if you go over or under the target cost. But anyway, what you're trying to do is incentivize your supplier to improve their performance. So it's a different type of arrangement. It's not fixed. It's not a fixed price. And it's a target cost, which has been a process of negotiation. And, you know, it can be pain or gain. And with a mains replacement, because they're, they're doing so many of these things, then over time you get a percentage of pain and a percentage of gain. But essentially you're trying to provide some form of incentivization to improve their performance. And these things are usually done between, say, a customer like National Grid and someone like Balfour or BT, you know, a strategic partner someone you have a close commercial relationship with and you're able to work together and understand the problem and manage the risk together. And this target cost and, and pain gain is really an effective vehicle for incentivizing Balfour Beatty to do well and for the customer national grid to make sure the risk is managed effectively for them and not to pay too much and not to pay too little. So it is a process process of negotiation. And you incentivize innovation, you incentivize transparency of information, so you're, so you're kind of working together. You can see each other's cost estimate, you can have some sort of negotiation about your assumptions in your cost estimate and say, okay, this is the target. We've, we've come to an agreement on the target based on our understanding, shared understanding of the work, 
and you know if we do well you'll make more profit so it's an incentive so this is your your kind of target cost incentive fee and indeed coming back to our old friend the three-point estimate you can see how a three-point estimate can be developed based on this target which is the most likely and then you've got this minimum and maximum when things go well or things don't go so well so you can develop that three-point estimate again so your performance partnering arrangement is you know it's, it's a different way of developing a contract to manage the risk So the whole point is to come to some sort of arrangement about the amount of profit which will be developed by the supplier. With the mains replacement, it's based over time. You know, they're laying so much main, so many meters a year. And so over time, you'd want Balfour BT to make you know, a degree of profit and improve, improve their capability, improve their performance. So, that, so they don't fall behind schedule. You know, they can't go to the you can't go to the general public and say we haven't, you know, we haven't updated the gas distribution system you know, because our contractor was not, wasn't managed effectively. So we've gone through all our quality gaps Remember requirements, specification, design, manufacturing, and you know you get to the end, and you, you might have to do some some rework. And you can see there, there's an estimate of the rework which can happen on the astute submarine. Um, at the end of all this, there could be lead time and storage problems as well. So you know the the accumulation of errors could could promote poor lead time even though you've made trade-offs in the Iron Triangle. Back to our, our example of BA Systems and their floor, their stable floor. Um, they're, they're, um, you know, they're, they're assembling uh, aircraft canopies with lots of electrical connections. And there are thousands of electrical connections. And if you just get a small percentage wrong, it's still a lot of connections you have to rework. So if you're dealing with large complexity, some of the percentage errors can be quite significant. So by the time you get to the end of your quality gaps, then your rework could be still a significant cost. So these kind of things we've, we've, been, we've been talking about, and it's the, you know, in project pandemic, if you can evaluate and select your contractors on a range, a range of criteria, so you've got a balanced selection, do these reviews, do these cross-disciplinary meetings where you get all the expertise in a room to point out things which are going to go wrong. Um, remember to visit the site to enable inspections and audits of, of, of what's being said is, has been done. And then manage any non-conformance and deviation and provide technical support as required. And if, if something is wrong, you have to go through this change procedure, which unfortunately is, is, you know, is a major cost driver. So basically when you commission, then you know, things can go wrong, like so. So something will go wrong in, in complex systems. In the uh, in Terminal Five, many years ago, the baggage system was so complex the training was poor as part of the project. So they had a quality gap in terms of training. So no one knew how to operate the baggage system. And it made the news headlines and kind of seized up Heathrow Airport for several days. I think it turned into about two weeks. They just couldn't process the baggage. And that was a quality gap. 
in terms of uh, project commissioning. You know, there's insufficient training and expertise. This is an example of uh, how, how nowadays, in terms of complex projects, PA systems as a supplier and MOD as a customer work increasingly together. You know, they, they, they sit in the same helicopters, occupy the same ships. You know, they, they, they've got a close supplier-customer relationship, which is the open book approach. And, and improved incentivization in terms of innovation and managing the risk together. So that's a classic example of working together to manage the risk. Now in terms of, in terms of uh, correcting things, then I guess you're going to need some sort of prioritization. And risk management is a way of prioritizing how to manage quality. So you want to prioritize areas which are going to have the most impact on your project. I guess in, in project pandemic, you could think, OK, where do we focus most of our effort in supply chain management? We'll use our risk register. We'll use our risk management to do that. So, so that's it for today. I mean, in summary, quality is about, it's about doing it right the first time. So it's this right first time approach. Your quality planning, in terms of your quality assurance and quality control, you know, it needs to be done as early as possible and with the right level of communication. Quality saves lives, reputation, time and money. I think that's clear from our pandemic uh, case study. And, you know, poor quality is always our problem from the supplier point of view. You know, the supplier gives you poor quality, it's the customer which suffers. And everyone should be responsible for quality, and that's total quality management. That's the development of the old quality gurus into modern theory of everyone is responsible for, for quality. And in terms of solving quality problems, then you need a risk-based approach. So where in the pandemic do you focus your quality management efforts? It's got to be based on risk as a prioritization. You can't do everything. So I, I did have another question on uh, about contracts in the pandemic, which I didn't, in, which I didn't include. Um, I guess that would be who owned the risk and who got incentivized in terms of pain and gain for these contracts. Something to reflect on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Were they ever paid for that? Were they ever paid properly for that? You know, they, they went the extra mile. They did something and didn't really get rewarded, I guess. Well, they had a lot of cash. You know, the, the taxpayers' funds versus a limited company. You got to, you got to go to the government. They, they can kind of absorb absorb the hit, but look at the political collateral they've suffered because of all the money they've spent. So it's not, it's never that simple. In project conservatives, project conservative government, they've lost a lot of reputation as well. Um, so that's, that's it for today. I wanted to, I'm getting questions about the test. So your test, I'll make an announcement on Blackboard um, will be in a computer cluster. So it will be on campus, managed by the exam people. Um, it will be a certain number of questions based on the early part of the course. I'll be very clear about which lectures. Certainly two, three, four and five. I'm working out whether to include the other one yet, the cost one. 
I'm finalising the questions at the moment, but certainly two, three, four, and five. And I'll post, I'll post uh, a previous test this week on Blackboard for practice. So that we'll be ready to take questions next week about that. So I'll have a bit of time to talk about that as well. And that's 50% of your marks. And the reason why you've got MCQs, multiple choice questions, as 50% is the first half of the course is, is, is less about essays and the second half of the course is more about essays. And you should be able to look at the previous exam questions to see what type of essay questions you get as well, which I'll try and promote visibility of on Blackboard as well. So um, the best way is to practice previous questions. Um, I think if you're, if you're good at the tutorials, then that's a good thing. Um, if you've got the main points of the recommended reading, that's also a good thing as well. So it's difficult to say, but there'll be a range of calculations and definitions uh, and testing your understanding of concepts. And you'll have you know, a range of potential answers to choose from. In previous years, there's been about 30 questions. Some questions are worth more. Some of the, some of the calculation questions can be worth more. But I've not finalised the questions yet, so I can't really go into detail about that. No, I mean, what I mean is, I guess, is written responses. So it's, it's, it's written response questions in line with the marking scheme. So you'll see how much, how, you'll see the question. There'll be, you know, a key verb um, asking you about a certain area. And then, you know, be a certain amount of marks for that. And that will reflect the amount of content you should put in there. So I, Yes, if you, if, you answer the past, if, you, if you focus on answering the past papers, that will, that, sh, that will prepare you for the written exam, which is in January. I realise I do provide a lot of information and examples, and perhaps I provide too many. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about reeling back on that, but I try to be as entertaining as possible in terms of interest, you know, real world examples which engages your understanding. But you know, the focal point is, is, the, is the slides, and I'm, what I'm trying to do is explain those slides with examples so that you understand and are able to explain them, uh, explain those things with examples. So that's the intended learning outcome, although I do go on a bit sometimes. Is that okay? Do you realise the lecture is over? I don't know. <laughs> See you on sleep. You're free. I'm happy to take questions um, as much as you want. Sorry. 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 I'm just a. Two, three, four, five. No, no. So it's the, it's the, both the tutorials. So you've got the network diagram, tutorial, earned value, tutorial, then. Um, I'm deciding whether to add more or not. Well, the tutor. Um, we didn't well, week one just provides you some good introduction, but you're not testing on week one. Yeah. 
I've not finalised the question, so it's, I'm trying my best to, to help you at the moment, but I, I don't want to hinder you either, so I've got to be careful. I don't confuse you. But I think, I think you know, the, tu the preparation for the tutorials and the tutorials themselves, you know, uh, uh, at least. And lecture one will provide you good context, leading to the... Good. Thanks, everyone.